Okay, good morning, everyone. Hope everyone's doing well. So today I'm going to be covering textbook chapter one material. But first, I just wanted to go over and represent a couple things. Um, the first, where we are right now, of course, is on CISS100.com. So we are in lecture module one. Lecture module one is due this coming Sunday night at 9 p.m. Recall, that's the that's the close of the school week, so to, so to speak, from Monday through Sunday. And I'm showing this because today I'm going to reference something out of one of the submenus. So recall in lecture module one, there are submenus here. I'm going to reference the emergent and disruptive change content. So hopefully everybody has read or will read the CISS100.com lecture module one material, but also make sure it's a quick read, go through and look at emergent and disruptive change because it really frames our environment. It lets us, it makes us aware of where we are in computing today. So again, CISS100.com, all it does is present information. It's essentially a textbook. Linux labs are here. Linux lab one do this week is just reading. Again, so I'll open it real quick and you'll see this. Again, I do recommend that everyone download the two textbooks. So here's the GNU Linux basic operating system. If I right click it, it'll give me the opportunity to save link as I showed this yesterday and it'll allow me to save it to my computer. And again, again, you're reading pages seven to 16 in that, that text and the Linux command line by William Schatz and that will actually be our primary textbook. Most of our reading will be from the Linux command line. So make sure you read this content, the Linux Lab 1 content, but also both of these, Linux command line by shots, you're reading page XVI through XX. So again, that's the CISS100.com. To moving to D2L Brightspace, okay? Um, again, I'm within, I'm in lecture module one here. Make sure you read the directions, which essentially tell you to read Linux Lab 1. You'll have two quizzes, the intro and syllabus quiz, which has unlimited time, unlimited attempts, and then the textbook quiz, textbook chapter one quiz, which you only get a single attempt on and it is timed, okay? And I presented this yesterday. And again, please do not omit participating in the class made into introductions. Even if it's just, hi, I'm James, get full credit. It would help us and other students to know your background and what you're really intending to go into, but whatever you know is, is you're comfortable with is fine. So right now I am going to jump to the textbook presentation, chapter one in the Understanding Computers textbook. Okay, so chapter one. <clears throat> chapter one, as in many you know, textbooks, is really just an overview. It frames the environment very generally. Everything presented in chapter one, we're actually going to cover in chapters, subsequent chapters that are dedicated to that specific content. In this regard, chapter one is an abstraction of the textbook. An abstraction is very important in computer science. So what is it? Abstraction is the process of removing physical, spatial, temporal details or attributes in the study of objects, right? When we study biology, we don't jump right into studying the genome, right? We study the basic principles and slowly over time, we get more and more detail. We do this in computer science. We're gonna look at the big picture, the environment, and then slowly we're going to look at the other components in detail, but it goes beyond this. In computer science, we actually have to embrace abstraction. Why? <clears throat> we cannot put objects from the real world, I'm kind of pointing out my window here, what you don't see, and put them in the computer. I need to model them. I need to represent them. So if I'm gonna perform a traffic simulation with cars and trucks, et cetera, I need to represent the cars. But do I need to represent the timing of their motors? how much gas is actually fed in when the driver presses the accelerometer or the acceler you know the acceleration pedal no so we deal in the general properties we get specific when we have to and over time we are going to study down to the root core level because that's really where where we need to embrace or address to secure our systems and to understand them properly so we will get there 
So abstraction is very important in computer science. So what do we need to represent? Well, we need to represent numbers. We need to represent text or characters. We need to represent audio. We need to represent video. And we need to represent objects, right? the car. <clears throat> and if I'm representing an object, again, I can further classify. It's going to have static or physical properties, but it also has behavioral properties, right? Now, if I just look at a rock, a rock only has static properties. It has weight, a shape, things like that, volume. It doesn't It's not going to do anything, okay? It can roll downhill, but that's not because of the rock. It's because of gravity, okay? And you, we, yes, we could say that a car requires a driver too. But when we look at objects and we represent them, we try to define their physical, static properties, as well as their behavioral or functional properties. So what you can see here, again, beginning study of this discipline, what are we doing a lot of? Classification. So, so what is a computer and what does it do? Okay, from the textbook, completely correct. Programmable electronic device, accepts data, performs operations. Okay, what are the basic operations? Really, the basic operations are input processing and output. This textbook adds storage and communications. Many textbooks do not. They'll just leave it at input processing and output. Because what is storage? I'm outputting and storing something. What are communications? Input and output. So when you really look at it, it's really just input processing and output. But again, for the sake of this course, we're just gonna follow the textbook and whatever it says and treat it as completely accurate information. So input processing and output, storage and communications. Now, this IPO, I don't have to say IPO at this point, input processing and output, <clears throat> occurs at three different levels. Moving from the discrete, the very small, to the you know more to to the larger granula granulation, we have the IPO taking place at the CPU level, the central processing unit. Okay, so of course this is the chip inside our computer. The CPU gets instructions and data from memory, performs processing on a very small level, and then puts the output back to memory. Okay, so it takes place at the CPU level. I can look at the device level, our computer sitting on our laps or phones, or however you're accessing this right now. I type on the keyboard, input. My computer does processing. In this case, maybe I'm just typing up a document, and then it presents it to me. Input, processing, and output from the device perspective or device level. But it also occurs at the systems level. When you go to register for a class, right, you're creating your class schedule. You're inputting your class schedule. There's processing that takes place. Of course, it spits out a schedule for you, but there's financial aid components, okay? And it maybe sends that to the federal govern government. If it was a really slick system, it would send you the textbook, required textbook via text. Uh, I've asked the college to do that. To date, they have not. Okay, so this IPO, input processing output, but there's also storage and communications, occurs at three different levels. The CPU, the device and the systems. Data versus information. Data is raw, unorganized facts. Can be numbers, can be characters, graphics, video, audio, etc. Information is data that has been processed into a meaningful form. And information processing is just that, converting the data into information. This is kind of you know abstract. What are we what are we actually doing here? Let me show you an example, I'll really make it clear very quickly. So here's some data, 01256-9856. And I pose the question, does this mean anything to anyone? And a few students have actually guessed correctly, but it shouldn't, okay? Because we don't guess in computer science. But I can process this very easily. If I put it into a table or give it a heading, SSN, suddenly this makes sense to everyone. And I didn't even write, Social Security, I just wrote SSN, and our brains Im immediately went, oh, Social Security, okay? They took that abstraction even to the next higher level, to knowledge, and I'm gonna present that in just a minute. 
So with this SSN, we know it's a social security number, but there's even more we know about it. It's unique text. And I say text, which means characters, not a number. Why? Well, consider social security numbers can begin with the number zero, right? The character zero. If we treat it as a number, what's the computer gonna do? Get rid of the number, get, get, get rid of that leading zero, right? I could ask you, what is the number zero three? Oh, it's three, right? Because you just dropped that leading zero, which is exactly what the computer would do. So we always have to consider how are we representing this? How do we retain that leading zero? Well, if we de define it as text, as characters, characters are significant. So we keep that zero, that leading zero, so to speak. Okay, so SSN is unique text, not a number, corresponds one-to-one -one with an individual. Here we're actually moving up into knowledge. So I'm presenting, this is not in the textbook, you're not required to know it for the course, for the quizzes, but you should know it for our ed computer science education here. So what we try to do as computer scientists is push data up to information, and then encode as much knowledge as we can, right? It's unique text, it corresponds one-to-one -one with an individual. And of course, as I say encoding, what am I saying? Programming, okay? The example here is with a red light. It's red, okay, it's raw, raw, raw data, it's red. Where is it? Well, it's south facing light on some street corner. Knowledge, right, I'm driving along, right? I see the red light, I better react and stop the car. This is an important level here, wisdom. Why? This is the level of artificial intelligence, AI. And again, this is my background. Um, you know, this is my work for Naval Underwater Systems Group in NASA. And over time, over the course, I will present more and more material on this. But I will let you know right now, and this is just my humble opinion here. It was about 2004 when I stopped being an advocate for just unrelenting AI research and development. And I'll talk more about that as we go on. And it's, again, it's just my opinion. Okay. Um, <clears throat> computers. When we look at any discipline, we look at the history of the discipline because it's informative, it's instructive, right? We learn from our history. When we look at computers, and we have a few different areas that we look at. We look at hardware, architecture. We look at programming, programming languages. We look at operating systems, system software. Each one can be characterized in generations. The textbook looks at hardware architecture from a generational perspective. It looks at programming languages from a generational perspective. It does not look at or define operating systems from a generational perspective, but I, I will show you how that correlates. In each new generation, they kind of move lockstep. So first generation hardware was they used first generation programming languages first generation operating systems, which really there was none at that point. Pre-computers, early computers, abacus, sly rule, et cetera. You know, conspicuously absent is a weaving loom. It follows an algorithm. Three strands of blue, two strands of red, one strand white. Three strands of blue, two strands of red, one white, maybe one green now, okay? It's an algorithm. I've never seen any textbook classify a weaving loom as an, as an early computer but it actually is doing computation. It's following an algorithm. So let's look at hardware from a generational perspective. First generation, 1946 to 1957. Truthfully, it was about late 1930s, right, right around the start of World War II. Um, <clears throat> they were powered by vacuum tubes. There was no operating system. There were no programming languages other than the machine instruction set which I'm gonna show you in a simulation. I'm gonna show you a, a fetch execute cycle simulation when we get to the chapter on architecture. So if you wanted to run a different program or even run a different data set within that same program, what these programmers had to do was rewire the entire computer, all the vacuum tubes, they'd have to rewire it. So first generation vacuum tubes, no operating system, programming language was just machine language second generation. And here we start to observe Moore's law. This is addressed in the, in the textbook. It's also, I did cite it in that CISS100.com emergent technology sublink 
off of lecture module one. And there are other things in there. Crider's law, we need to be aware of, Metcalf's law. I will not ask questions, but they frame the environment at how quickly our technological environment is advancing. So second generation, use transistors. Everything got smaller, less heat, more efficient, faster, but a big advance was input output, okay? Because now we had punch cards and magnetic tape. What this facilitated from an operating system perspective was batch processing. I could now put a program into memory and run different data sets. Great, okay? In terms of programming languages, we saw the introduction and evolution of assembly language. And again, I'll present this when we get to programming languages. Third generation, <clears throat> we saw transistors combined into integrated circuits. We also saw a big advance in input output, keyboards and monitors. And if you ever watch old 1960s movies, you know, that had computers in them, typically you'd see this room of these keyboards and monitors. This was actually the first client server environment. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. We also saw the introduction of hard drives for storage. This too was a big advance over magnetic tapes. Okay. Question coming? No. Again, if you have any questions, please let me know. Um, hard drives, we're going to learn when we cover storage, facilitate direct or random access, which means I can pull off anything. This is what we do today, right? If I want to play a song, I don't have to search my hard drive. It's right there, right? It's being presented to us in a graphical user interface, but still. <clears throat> in contrast, magnetic tapes are sequential storage. If I want to get to something or find something, fast forward, fast forward, is that it? Nope, fast forward, fast forward, is that it? Oh, I went too far. Rewind, rewind. Okay. You know, my generation, we're very aware of this because we had cassette tapes for our audio. So now magnetic tapes are still used for backup and other things. So I will address that when we get to storage as well. Pardon me, this is where I start to lose my voice. Fourth generation computers. We now integrate, combine, integra elect the uh, integrated circuits into microprocessor. <clears throat> okay. We also see advance of graphical user interfaces, hence keyboard and mice for input. Um, great advances in storage, you know, solid state storage, et cetera. And we saw the introduction of networking and, and of course the internet. And we rely on this today. We don't, even, we don't even think about isolated computing today. We think about networked computers. Pardon me. Big jug of water there. Okay, fifth generation. <clears throat> fifth generation is purely speculative. Okay. The textbook says, you know, most commonly defined as being based on artificial intelligence. Well, AI is software, right? We're talking hardware here. So that's actually not correct. Um, again, for the quiz, fifth generation, most commonly defined as being based on artificial intelligence. That's that's your response on the quiz. Um, my perspective, it's quantum computing. Our computing today, your phones, your tablets, your computer, whatever you're on, is based on the von Neumann architecture, which is a stored program, right? We have storage, we have hard drives. It's brought into memory and executed. I'll talk more about that mechanism when we get to operating systems. But it's based on discrete logic. We use many different terms here, Boolean logic, et cetera. Zeros and ones. We only have two states. It's either on or off. It's zero, one. It's true or false. That's it. Quantum computing facilitates the representation of intermediate states. So not just restricted to true or false, black and white, on or off. Because again, what is computer science? What do we need to do? We need to model and represent our world. What is our world? Again, I'm pointing out my window here. It's analog, right? So anytime we try to force analog into this digital two-state environment, we're going to, going to have errors. So my belief is quantum computing. Now, quantum computing supports AI far better than our traditional von Neumann architecture. So I'll leave it at that. So, so the, the textbook statement is not, you know, completely incorrect, but AI is software. You know, no one's building a computer just for AI. And then if they are, it's probably a quantum computer. 
contemporary computing. Um, you know, we use the words pervasive or ubiquitous. What this means is, of course, you know, we all, we all have cell phones these days, right? Which is a computer. It's actually a very powerful computer. It's with us all the time. It's ubiquitous, pervasive. I can do it anywhere. It's also what we're seeing is convergence. And convergence can be very beneficial, but also very disruptive. We're seeing convergence at the chip level. We're seeing everything move onto the chip. GPUs are moving on to and alongside the CPU, along with the network interface card. If everything's closer together, of course, those, those transmission pathways are shorter. Everything's going to be quicker. Just even transmission latencies are shortened. But convergence can also be very disruptive. Again, in that CISS100.com lecture module one submenu on emergent technology, I introduced the business IT society triangle business IT society. So these three components occupy the vertices mm -hmm. of this triangle. It's not in the textbook, you're not required, but we need to acknowledge this. We need to acknowledge that any change in any one of these three components, a change in business practices is going to drive a change in IT, it's gonna drive a change in society. A change in society is gonna drive a change in IT and drive a change in business. And of course, any new, new thing that comes along in IT is going to drive a change in business and society. Let me give you an example. The convergence of the cell phone and the camera. You guys take it for granted. I know that. Um, but I lived through that. And I saw the changes that were, that were driven by that. So they you know, made cell phones with cameras in. Great. Some great positive things came out of it, you know? People could record things in real time. A plane crashed in the Hudson River and it was all over social media, again, 15 minutes before it hit, you know, CNN and, you know, all, all the news channels. Okay, great. There were some downsides to it too, though, which may be seen as a downside in business. Um, the Chicago Tribune newspaper fired all of its staffed photographers because then it just had the reporters take pictures. Okay, so great, Ch Chicago Tribune was more fiscally responsible. They did things, you know, better from a fiscal standpoint. But what if you were one of those staff photographers? You were out of a job. Disruption. Another case, suddenly people had phones with them or, or cameras with them all the time. They started taking pictures in places they shouldn't. Locker rooms, children's playgrounds, which forced new legislation. And there's always going to be a lag. Something new comes out in IT and you have this great perspective of how it's going to be used and someone will come along and abuse it, which will require laws. So that change required a change in society, okay? So convergence can be great, often is, it's why we do it, you know, to get these positive enhancements. But we have to be aware of all the ramifications. So I'm asking you, as we develop systems, as, we, as you program, Try to see the big picture. And I give the example quite often, you know, from Jurassic Park. It was what Ian McDonald, the character. And he said, you know, all you did was took the existing research, you stood on their shoulders and just determined if you could do it without looking at the big picture, all the other negative repercussions that may occur from whatever it is you develop. And that's what hopefully we'll do. Okay, so hardware. Again, when we're learning a subject, especially you know, in the very early stages, we classify, we categorize. So when I look at hardware, yes, it can be internal, it can be external. And again, going back to business IT society, well, what are the ramifications? Okay. Internal is very accessible. The iPad, right? You pick one up, everything's in the box, you know, that, that same enclosure, highly useful. What if something goes wrong on it, you know, that can't be repaired? And iPads, they're, they're packed in there so tightly, a lot of things cannot be repaired. It goes in the landfill, right? And what our computers today, the components are so bad for the environment, but we can't just focus on that, what's going in the landfill. Oh, it's just one iPad. Well, no, because now new materials, we're probably gonna buy a new one, need to be sourced. And sourcing lithium, all of these electronic components. Also, they use so many things and do so many things to our environment that are bad, we need to actually look at the big picture. We can't just look at the box of when you buy the iPad and then it goes into the, to the landfill. We have to draw the box starting 
when we source the materials. Okay, but in internal hardware, it's very nice, it's easy to use, great, okay? External hardware is not. In my graduate work, I had a silicon graphics machine. It's actually the same machine that they used to develop, you know, the Jurassic Park movies. And everything was external. My desk was a complete mess of cords. But when it came time to upgrade a hard drive, I'd upgrade the hard drive. Nothing else would go into the landfill. So again, business IT society, and in that society, I'm always aware of the environmental impact. Okay, input processing and output devices. Again, we have a chapter on input and output. I'm not gonna say much right now. Keyboards, mice, scanners, et cetera. There are things conspicuously missing, sensors, internet of things, haptics, which is sensory, the best example for sensory. Um, if you look at our cars today, right? They have collision avoidance or lane departure. You know, you depart your lane, your steering wheel vibrates because it's gonna catch your attention quicker than your speaker saying to you, oh, you've left your lane. Um, your seat may vibrate if you're about to back into something. It's going to catch your attention very quickly. So the textbook does not capture these. And these were out when the textbook was published. The authors just did not include it. Storage devices. We have an entire chapter on storage devices. At this juncture, no, recognize please, storage is persistent, your hard drive. I turn the power off, the data the program should still be there. In contrast to memory, where you turn your computer off, whatever's in memory is wiped clean, okay? So storage is persistent, memory is not persistent. There's another term for it, storage is non-volatile, memory is volatile. Communications devices. Again, I'm not going to say much here. Um, we have two full chapters on networking and the internet. So I'm going to defer these, but we're familiar. Modems, network adapters, things of this nature. And again, a lot of people aren't aware of these network adapters these days because some of these devices are just wireless. The network interface card, the NIC, people never even get involved with. It's not like a modem from you know, Time Warner or Spectrum. Okay, so we have hardware and we have software. Again, we're doing this classification, right? Hardware and software. Hardware, I can have internal and external. Within hardware, I have you know, the processing functionality of the input and output. Looking at software, again, I can further define it as system software, which is the most conspicuous part of it is the operating system. The other would be application software, apps. Again, we have an entire chapter on system software with the operating system, an entire chapter on application software. So I'm not gonna say much except to introduce that the operating system is the resource manager. It manages everything. Without an operating system, our computers will not run. <clears throat> operating system knowledge may be the most important knowledge you can garner. When we look at security, right? What does a hacker want to do? They want to steal, take advantage, corrupt, whatever, your resources. So what's the resource manager? The operating system. So it's the operating system's job to defeat those attacks, those vulnerabilities. And we'll look at this. We have an entire chapter on security, an entire chapter on operating system. And again, our Linux labs are really going to open our eyes to the operating system. Application software, I'm not going to say a single thing about at this juncture. We all have apps on our phone. We have apps, you know, applications on our computers. <clears throat> Pardon me. I'm not going to say anything on computer users and professionals. When we co cover the, the chapter on programming, you're very, you're going to become very aware of what a programmer does. When we cover the chapter on networking, you're going to become very aware of what networking engineers do. When we cover systems analysis, you're going to know what a system analyst does. So I'm not going to say anything at this juncture. Again, we can categorize computers on how they are applied. That's their functionality. Okay, embedded mobile, personal, server, mainframe. Let me just say that the distinctions between these can be very fuzzy. Okay, um, A server can be a mainframe. A mainframe can be a server. 
when you look at personal computers. If you look at an iPad with an integrated keyboard, you know, in its, in its enclosure, um, its cover, it's actually a mobile device. So the mobile device is both a personal computer and a mobile device. Um, you look at some of the Microsoft Surface um, tablets, things like that. They can be both. Um, so again, this distinction here is very, you know, very fuzzy. Um, one thing to know and recognize, again, business IT society, right, about embedded computers. So as soon as we put a CPU in any device, it becomes a computer. It inherits all the properties and importantly, vulnerabilities of a computer. And as soon as I say that, it can be hacked. It's really what I'm saying. So a car, our cars have computers, they can be hacked. They can be hacked through digital radio communications. And I'll show you this later on. It's possible, they've shown this Caltech and, and a few other universities, that they can actually remotely turn your car off, okay? Will the police have this ability someday? They can turn your brakes off. Imagine driving down, downhill, a mountain road, and someone turns your brakes off, especially if you're moving 50 miles an hour. Rather frightening. Medical devices, pacemakers, insulin injectors underneath the skin, all of these things can be hacked. As soon as I put a CPU with networking capabilities into any device, it can be hacked. And I'll say, I'll introduce this now. If I never connect my computer to the network, to the internet, it's secure. You know, you'd actually have to physically get my computer to hack it. So, you know, security, operating systems, and networking, they're all integrated in separately. Mobile devices, our phones, iPads, not saying anything here. We're going to look at mobile computing, you know, and especially we'll look at mobile computing and how it applies to contemporary computing. Really, what are its constraints on a phone? Really small screen, difficult to do IO, you know, if you're texting little fingers, voice recognition is, you know, helping, things like that. Battery, power, and we'll look at all these too. Okay, portable computer. A puppy's trying to get in my office here. I wish the uh, textbook didn't present this here or at least presented client server computing first. Because we have to understand client server computing before we can talk about thin client computing. Okay, client server. The basic example, you know, I'll use Burger King. I don't eat Burger King. Um, but I walk into Burger King, I'm a client, I place an order and they serve me something, they give me a resource. And that's all client server computing is, right? You have clients <laughs> requesting resources from a server. What kind of resources? Files, right? An email server, they're requesting their email, things like that. So Gmail, Hudson Valley, your email <clears throat> is client server. Um, G Drive, Google Drive, things like that. So that's all client server computing is. Um, Characterized, again, you watch some old 1960s movies, you have a room full of dumb terminals, you know, and that's just a keyboard and a monitor. Some Someone's typing in, that message goes back to the server, the processing is done on the server, and then they come back and refresh your screen, which is that resource. So that's just client-server computing. Now, <clears throat> that works in a command line, just a character-based environment, because the communications bandwidth required is not that extensive. As soon as we go to these graphical user interfaces that we're, we enjoy today, we depend on, the bandwidth goes up significantly, okay? So thin client computing tries to get at least lessen some of that bandwidth. They'll put a minimal operating system on the client so I don't have to go back to the server all the time for these monitor refreshes. My computer, my thin client can handle that. To some extent, not completely, that is the Hudson Valley environment. The Hudson Valley uses a virtual desktop interface, which is kind of an extension of this thin client architecture. And you'll see it, by the way, as the acronym VDI, okay? The Hudson Valley Academic Computing Environment, you'll see ACE, right? The HVCC ACE uses a virtual desktop interface, VDI. So the HVCC ACE uses VDI, and there's 
those are those acronyms. And again, I did that for a reason <clears throat> because again, this discipline uses so many acronyms. And if you don't understand, look it up. You need that understanding. If we're in class, of course, stop me and ask that question. I guarantee if you, if you don't know it, someone else in class does know. Okay. The distinction between a server and a mainframe is also nebulous. Um, a server can be a mainframe. A mainframe typically is a server. Um, so, you know, they're classifying here based on size. Okay. Um, both can use virtualization. I'm not going to introduce virtualization here because we need to understand operating systems first. I will present virtualization and operating systems. And then from there on out, we'll talk about it almost in every chapter and how it can be applied. In coming in Linux Lab 9, everyone will implement their own virtual machine. So you'll actually implement virtualization and you'll implement your own Linux instance so that you have administrative permissions. Getting ahead of myself. This is this is in our future. Supercomputers, you know, here's a moving target. A supercomputer from five years ago, if it hasn't been updated, is no longer a supercomputer. So where is that bar today? Um, again, it will vary depend on, depending on who defines it. Computer networks and the internet. Again, we don't even consider computing today without networked computing. We rely on it. Okay. Quite often people, most of the people out there just use their computers to access networks. They're not really doing much on them beside, besides accessing social media, sending emails, things of this nature, basic documents. And our computers are so powerful. They're, they're so undertasked by these, these tasks. <clears throat> the internet and World Wide Web. At this juncture, all I want you to understand is that the internet and the World Wide Web are not the same thing. The internet is the infrastructure. It's a type of network, you know, ubiquitous at this point. Um, <clears throat> and when I say it's the infrastructure, it has both the lines, fiber optic, coaxial cable, things of this nature, even, even plain old telephone line, plain old telephone service. It has devices, routers, modems, switches, transponders, et cetera. But it also has software, okay? Protocols, rules that are encoded. So the internet is the infrastructure. On the internet runs or exists the World Wide Web, which is just linked information. Many things run on the internet, and we're gonna see that over time. Beginning next week in Linux Lab 2, you will connect to the Hudson Valley ACAD NX server, right? Your machine will be a client and you'll connect through secure shell connection, SSH. This is not the World Wide Web, but you will be using the internet to connect from your computer to the Hudson Valley ACAD NX server. So that's coming next week in Linux Lab 2. When we look at <clears throat> accessing the network, um, we have internet addresses. And I'm not, I'll say it now, but I'm not going to define it. It's a virtual or logical address. Um, we have both physical addresses and we have virtual addresses. And again, just recognize there are two types at this point. For me to actually fully define that, it would take about 20 minutes, which we don't have and should not be presented in chapter one either. <clears throat> so when I look at an IP address, or me there, we are still transitioning from IPv4 to IPv6. It was speculated we would have just moved to IPv6 right away and that hasn't occurred. IPv4 uses four byte addresses, right? And we see the bytes are separated by a period or decimal point. We're gonna learn that a byte is eight bits. So this is 32 bit addressing. Addressing in computer science is very important. And we're gonna look at this because um, a lot of the architecture or what our capabilities, what we can do is driven or defined by our addressing. IPv6, 16 bytes. And if you, of course, if you multiply four by 16, you get 128 bit addressing. Domain name, top level domain name, ESPN.com, hvcc.edu, you know. Um, uniform resource locators, links 
us or allows us to access address information. Okay. Um, and quite often, uh, you know, our hyperlinks to some extent are URLs as well, or they refer us to URLs. I'm not going to say anything on email addresses. Everybody knows. Okay. But we do need to become very specific with the components of it because you'll need this for our Linux labs, a username at domain name. So for me, of course, my Hudson Valley email, j.luby at hvcc.edu, where hvcc.edu is the domain name. Cloud computing. There's nothing really mysterious about cloud computing. All cloud computing is, is client server computing with a web interface which means the server is providing its resource through HTML, which can be rendered in any, in any browser. We know this, Gmail, right? You could access your Gmail in Safari if you're on Mac or you know, Internet Explorer on Windows or Google Chrome, okay? Or you know, Brave browser, any of these browsers because it's create a, created, a, cloud computing has created a standardization by presenting the information to the client in using a web interface through encoding hypertext markup language, HTML. And we'll look at this, but we really need to look at the web and HTML encoding before we do that. There are many benefits to cloud computing. There are drawbacks too. It's not all good. And we'll look at this throughout the course as well, especially in systems analysis, because we'll need to make the determination. Do I implement and store things here locally? Do I put them in the cloud? You no, know, stored here, great, I own it. Cloud, I have this recurring cost, but there are other benefits and, and you know, negative consequences as well. <clears throat> Pardon me. Surfing the web, not gonna say a word. Everybody I'm sure does it. I do wanna remind everyone, um, we know how to search the web, of course, you know, search bars or even just using the location bar up in the browser. Recall though, this is very important. I can search any web page, and again, PDF documents, which means the Linux lab textbooks are PDF and shown in a browser as a web page. Any PDF document or web page can be searched for specific words using Control F in Windows or Linux or Chromebooks. Control F, search box will open. I type in one, you know, I'll be led to whatever that term is on that page. Or in Mac using Command F, CMDF. Okay, so this will prove to be your friend in the Linux labs. Control F and Command F to search web pages or of course, PDF documents. <clears throat> email, I'm not gonna say anything about. We know email. Technology and society. Again, business IT society. <clears throat> Our world has changed and it's changing quickly. And there are many things. I'm gonna talk about the technology acceptance model. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna talk about people's ability to adapt to new technologies. Humans typically learn on a linear fashion. You know, we can, we can accommodate new technologies. Technology today is now an asymptote, okay? It's increasing at a geometric factor. People no longer have the ability to remain abreast of technological advances. We need to look at this, especially when we look at, let's say, the digital divide, and we will do this as well. So there are many benefits, you know, social networking, things like that. Um, <clears throat> social networking had many effects to where information gets out and is spread quicker than the news agencies. Um, there's many things going on though too with the algorithmic control of the social media and social networking. Um, <clears throat> a lot of risks. You know, people can become addicted to many things, games, social media, et cetera. There's studies out now from MIT and Oxford University in England that show social networking makes people feel worse about themselves. Um, so security issues, we're gonna look at that. Just look at from a business perspective, you know, how does a small business compete with Amazon? Amazon is there 24 seven, including now phone support 24 seven. How does a small business compete against that? You can wake up at 427 in the morning Go to your computer and place an order with Amazon. You can't do that with the mom and pop shop down the road. So how, you know, how do how does this progress? What happens in the future? 
I'm not sure spam is a privacy issue, but we'll leave it at that. Um, online communications, we've seen online communications. Another study out of Oxford, England showed that people <clears throat> react to electronic communications differently. If they get a letter in the mail, this is the study they did from say a creditor, you owe this money, you know, people be like, okay, fine. But when they get the same information, exactly the same in their email, they would be offended. There's something about the computer that makes it more personal. Um, it's more directed. Um, maybe we're less disassociated. I, I don't know what it is. And Oxford didn't come up with any conclusions either. Um, but there's something different about computer communications. You know, there's the anonymity factor in social media. People will say things they probably never would have said to someone else's face because they're separated time and distance. Okay. Um, so, you know, netiquette, be, be nice. Um, when it comes to search, you know, it's becoming increasingly difficult to assess the information. I'm not sure if you're aware, I have a minute or two left here, so I'll, I'll, I'll end on this. There's only one last slide. Um, <clears throat> if you and I were to search using Google, um, the exact same terms, I'm not sure if you're aware that we would get different results. There's algorithmic control that's taking place now. The search engines will call it tailoring. They're giving you information you want to see or information they think you want to see or worst case scenario, information they want you to see and of course, information they don't want you to see. This is taking place. This has been proven. Um, it makes it difficult for us for academic research, right? If you're doing academic research, you need to see it all. I don't want to write a paper just on what Google has led me to, wants me to see, and wants me to write about, you know, pair it. Um, and this is taking place. Now, I'm going to show you that. Um, so that, that's coming also. Um, that's the end of the chapter. So again, lecture module one is due Sunday night. Make sure you complete the intro syllabus quiz, textbook chapter one quiz. Please participate in the discussion board, even if you just say, hi, I'm James. Um, and make sure you do the Linux reading. Um, that may be the most critical. Um, if you don't do the Linux reading and, and reread it several times over time, week seven, you'll have to come back and reread what you read in the first week. Um, you will not do as well as you can. So that's all I have. Have a great day. Have a great week and weekend. Again, if I can help in any capacity, even beyond this course, let me know. I'm here. See ya.